Hello, I am Morris Kohansky, Wilderness Living Skills Instructor. Today's topic is birch bark. Here I have a, a hat that uh, is Finnish. When I wear it, a lot of people say that I look very Finnish when I, when I do that. Birch bark is a very um, versatile material. The uh, regions of the north where it grows, it's a cold climate type tree. One of the few trees that uh, can actually endure sun shining on it from all directions. Where other trees don't like that, birch can cope with it. There are many things that can be made out of birch, primarily baskets and buckets. So here's a hat. What it is, it's a basket that is woven in such a way that it appears to be a hat. And I think that it probably might not be rainproof, but it most certainly would keep your head cool uh, and shaded sort of thing. Now, I have worked with birch bark most of my life. Uh, probably the oldest basket that endures from the early days when I was learning is here. And I think it got stepped on because one day I noticed this big crack. However, I couldn't bear to throw it out. Uh, uh, if there's anything I feel arrogant about is what I think I know about birch bark work, you might say. Here we have a spiral stitch that is uh, much faster than some other stitches in that uh, you use about a fraction of the spruce roots. So here we have something made of three fragile materials, birch bark, willow for rims, and spruce root. Here is another one that I was working with and ended up keeping because of so many flaws. But if there is anything, it was the regularity of the stitching. This particular stitching is something that um, uh, um, is not for decorative reasons as much as it is for something that's durable. Because if your stitching is not done correctly, very quickly you find the basket or the bucket in one hand and the rim in the other. The perhaps most sophisticated uh, uh, tray or whatever that I've ever made is this one, made out of uh, perfectly chosen bark with the step down stitch. This is well traveled. It went to the to the UK and back. I had made a whole series of these for my wife to give to as gifts to the relative she was going to encounter and one relative she could not locate so the basket came back and so uh, because of that we we have it where normally I don't have the opportunity to uh, keep these things because generally they're anniversary or wedding presents. If this is made so solid that it won't flex, it's going to be passed down to your great-great-grandchildren. Now in Sweden, we have very small diameter trees. Not far from where I'm talking here, in this part of the world, we got trees where I have actually found a birch tree that would take two people to hug the tree. So the bark they use there is fairly thin and it's always taken off in a spiral and you can tell that when you examine the lenticels or the, the type of markings that, you, uh, that birch is uh, associated with. And weaving a, a uh, shopping bag or pack basket and so on is done in the way that you start with the, uh, the side opposite and it's actually always two layers. So by the time the weaving is done, you end up having um, something that is uh, made with something that's quite flexible and stays quite flexible. When you work with thick bark like we have here, we generally find that it doesn't seem to create as nice an effect. Here we have a system of, of uh, weaving baskets, the rim of which I learned to do in Sweden from a Finnish basket maker, and I've yet to see the construction of this rim. It's uh, not uh, uh, self-evident on how it's made. Here, the strips are so thin, they're tucked under with ease. Here, you can't tuck. You'll just break the, the strip. So you've got to have this, uh, this sideways making of the rim where uh, you can cope. This uh, also is applied to um, thin splints. Now, I didn't know how to do that weaving, so I had to use the technique where rims were stitched on, you might say. But this is done with spruce splints, which we'll talk about later. <coughs> we have different sizes of basket. Uh, the ones here would be called berry baskets. 
Uh, you can weave baskets like this out of the cardboard from cornflakes or out of cereal boxes and it will be remarkably durable. There will likely be a video in the future which will go into the construction of some of these sort of things in, in great detail. One common artifact that you find that is uh, found with uh, birch bark is the megaphone in moose hunting. As much as I know about. This would probably be about, a, well if I made this for you I would have to charge you $75 because of the labor intensity. The native people tend to make things like this which uh, uh, are functional but a lot cheaper. Perhaps it is enough of a megaphone, but it's a lot smaller. Uh, both are found in the literature, and I based mine on the on the uh, um, the the bigger ones that are maybe preferred more in the east. Now the culmination of birch bark work is the construction of canoes. Now here's a scale model. So you can imagine that this is probably one fifth scale. Take five of them end to end, and you'd come up with a full-size canoe. In the attempt of building a scale model, you try to uh, um, uh, repeat every little nonce that you would use in building a full-size canoe. And in so doing in scale model, it's often a greater challenge because it's easier to build a big canoe than maybe to build uh, this one. And I'm particularly proud of the fact that I can build canoes that are so symmetrical and not distorted when you examine them uh, lengthwise. Inside are black spruce splints. Uh, we encounter them in the in the basket weaving. Uh, when your splinting is done thin enough that it lends itself to this type of work. Well that's what you have in here mostly. Of course the splints would be much thicker in a full-size canoe and here they're almost paper thin. The stitching is spruce roots and uh, a lot of this has to be special wood that doesn't, uh, the stitching holes don't pull out and so on. Uh, by the time you build one or two of these scale models, when you don't have an instructor, uh, to build a, a one or two is like working under an instructor and then you can tackle a full-size canoe because basically you can purposely use all the steps that are used in building a full-sized canoe. The work with birch bark is something that is um, uh, almost addictive. Once you start experiencing the great satisfaction that you get from taking these materials and putting them together in traditional ways. There's a time in one's life where you do an awful lot of this and I would say that happened to me about 20 years ago.